All right. Welcome to another class that we have with Black Diamond Mortgage. We're going to talk about government-backed loans today. I'm Maria Phelps, and I have been working in the mortgage industry since 2015. And I tell you what, I love government-backed loans. The reason why is because I personally got one in 2015, and it really helped me a lot because you know, the challenges that I had in my own personal loan, the FHA loan was actually what helped me. I had a little high DTI, I was self-employed and uh, there's probably other things. Uh, Dave actually did my loan and I'm sure he could tell me a few other things that were on my loan, but it was the FHA loan that made it possible. We were able to do a low down payment and get our foot in the door. And now when I look at, you know, that was 2015, I look at the, the, how, how hard it was in my brain to get that loan. But then at the same time, now I look at it and we have a ton of equity. So uh, government backed loans are kind of near and dear to my heart. And then honestly, for the first three or four years of my career, I feel that that's mostly what I did FHA, VA and USDA loans. So uh, basically whatever I say today does not mean that that is the only thing about these loans. This is a 30 minute class and there's a lot about these loans and I cannot possibly get all of it on these three loan products done in 30 minutes. <laughs> so uh, we'll make room for questions, but I just wanna start with that. There's a lot to these loans. And so today we're gonna talk about FHA, VA and USDA loans. And we're gonna start with FHA. So FHA is honestly one of my favorites because it really does work with a high amount of borrowers, whether you have credit or income challenges. And honestly, sometimes the FHA loan, even if you do qualify for conventional, the FHA loan is a better product for you. Uh, we look at, when I have a client come in that has the potential to do FHA or conventional, I like to do side by side because sometimes the payment is even better on FHA. So we like to look at both of those. Uh, with FHA, you know, one of the biggest key pieces with FHA is we literally can go down to 500 credit score. Uh, that's helpful because, you know, sometimes people are in a situation where they, you know, have some derogatories on their credit. They don't have the perfect credit. FHA is a great loan program for that. We can also go very high on the debt to income ratio. So FHA can go, I've personally seen up to 56% on the back end debt ratio. Now, if you're not familiar with what that means, you have two types of ratios that we are gonna be talking about throughout the, throughout the morning, but our front end is our housing ratio. So that is literally just your housing payment, your taxes and your insurance on the house. And also, also if there's HOA and private mortgage insurance. Now, when you look at the housing, the housing has to be lower. Well, FHA can go up to 47% on the front end housing ratio. Conventional is often capped at 45. There are some situations where we've seen up to 49 on conventional, but as a rule, 45 is pretty standard on conventional. So the fact that you can go up to 47 is really great with FHA, especially in this current environment with the purchase prices. But then on the flip side, you have the back end ratio. That is all your other debts. So that's your uh, vehicles, your uh, credit cards, any installments that you have, plus your house. So with FHA, we can literally go up to 56% on uh, different, uh, the credit profile is going to be the main component to that higher 56%. But that's where I love FHA loans because it really does allow you to maximize the, the income and the purchasing power for clients. Uh, the other cool thing with FHA, you know, I, I talked about kind of doing a side-by-side -side comparison. Oftentimes you can get more house too with FHA. So, and, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the rural development loan, but you know, when we compare these loans side by side, we like to give comparisons on the different loan programs because yes, maybe somebody qualifies for USDA and FHA, but maybe their buying power is a little lower with USDA and they decide, you know, I wanna buy this house because it's 450,000 and I can afford that on FHA, 
but on USDA, I can only go to uh, 350. You know, it could potentially be a hundred thousand swing in buying power, depending on the loan program. With that, we have our purchase price and our loan amounts on FHA do have, or, or excuse me, not the purchase price, but the the loan amount does have caps on FHA. And I should have looked it up, but uh, Dave might be able to remember, but the the loan amount has gone up significantly, the, the eligible loan amount. For Flathead County, because we are in a high cost area, the base loan amount for a single family unit is 558,900. When I first started, I think it was 300 something. <laughs> like it has absolutely changed. Uh, it, th there's different factors that play into that. Gallatin County is actually 718,000 for a loan limit for a single family. Uh, other, other counties, most of the counties in Flathead, or excuse me, most of the counties in Montana are going to be at 498, 257. But uh, again, you, it is county specific. So you need to double check the different counties when you're looking at these FHA loans and just making sure that, you know, if you do have a borrower that needs to fit within that FHA loan, that, that you know what the cap is. Now, let's say it is 558, 900. And, you know, the minimum down payment with FHA is three and a half percent. But let's say they find a house that's higher than that. And they have to potentially, you know, they can't just do three and a half percent. They might have to bring in 5% or 10%. The borrower is absolutely able to bring in more to get that loan amount down to that loan limit that FHA has. So, so that is an option. Now, when we're talking also about the, uh, the loan limit, when you go to two unit, three unit, and four unit, you actually can borrow even more money. So I'll throw out a few more numbers just for fun, but you can buy a two unit FHA. Uh, loan limit is 715,500. So 715,500. A three unit is 864,850. And a four unit is over a million dollars, <laughs> 1,074,800. So you can see how FHA could actually be a really good loan product for certain people. And I haven't talked about this, but the down payment requirement is only three and a half percent. And that works on a one unit up to a four unit. So you can literally buy a four unit FHA property with three and a half percent down on. So that's, you can go up to a million dollars and just have three and a half percent down. Uh, that was a lot. <laughs> okay. I said a lot of numbers out there. Uh, there are some cravats, I guess, with FHA, you know, we do allow lower credit score, but sometimes with the lower credit score, the debt to income has to be a little bit lower, or sometimes we do need a little more down. Uh, oftentimes, a 10% down on FHA when it's below 580 basically solves a lot of problems. So sometimes just having a little more equity with that lower credit score helps. And FHA is another, it's just a great program for that. Now, the other thing about FHA is that you do need good employment history. Uh, the tricky part with FHA is when there's a gap of employment of over six months. Now, there are ways around it, but it's definitely something that you just really have to talk to a loan, a loan officer on that and make sure you know, uh, make, make sure that FHA works. The other thing, too, is, you know, when you have an FHA loan, because you are putting three and a half percent down and it's a government backed loan, you do have mortgage insurance. So mortgage insurance with FHA, what they require is an upfront premium that is financed into the loan. And then there's also a monthly insurance premium. Now, the cool thing is, is if you do a larger down, then you, you can, if you go 10% down on FHA, you do have that mortgage insurance for about 11 years, but then on the 12th year, it falls, falls away. So if you do the three and a half percent down, you do have the same mortgage insurance premium for the life of the loan. Uh, the mortgage insurance on FHA does stay the same. So it's 
constant for everyone. And then, um, which is different than conventional. Conventional is based off credit score, DTI, uh, loan amount, or, or excuse me, not loan amount, down payment. And so there's a different factors that affect conventional mortgage insurance. So that's the other cool thing about FHA is that it is a constant. And so uh, it's a good one for uh, your clients to understand as well. Now, property eligibility, this is always a question that we get asked, especially when real estate agents are uh, talking to us and they're potentially putting in an offer on a property. They get a little nervous when it's a government loan. So FHA does require to follow HUD standards. Now, that it's a huge book. The whole HUD handbook is hundreds of pages. But bottom line with FHA, actually USDA and VA, is we just want to make sure that health and safety are, are the priority. So if you've got electric wires, uh, the roof is falling apart, like and, and chipped and peeling paint, you know, things like that uh, are really what any of these government loans look for. But some of that stuff can be fixed prior to the appraiser even going out to the property. We don't look at the inspection report, uh, the borrowers do, the agents do, but as a lender, we don't, we don't look at those things. We just look at what the appraiser notifies us about. So just keeping in mind that when you're looking at the, any of these government loans, they really just need to follow health and safety standards. Okay, that was a lot of FHA. <laughs> um, there's, again, there's a lot more with FHA. Uh, those are the key points. Uh, I guess one final piece is that FHA does have some really good down payment options where you can do forgivable grants or repayable grants. Uh, FHA is great for that program as well. So we're going to talk about VA. Now, VA is actually another one of my favorite loan programs because the VA loan is truly, if, if we have a veteran come in, like that is probably the best loan program for them. There's rare instances where maybe a, a veteran would ser serve better doing a conventional loan just due to maybe they have a, a funding fee that they have to deal with. And uh, so there's different circumstances that the conventional may work better for a veteran, but ultimately if you are a veteran and you're eligible for a VA loan, that is absolutely the loan that we look at first. We're going to just check your certificate of eligibility just to make sure if you have a funding fee or not, because that does help determine how you, uh, what works better with the loan program as well. And then, so VA, a few big things, there's no down payment requirement, there's no loan limits, and there is no mortgage insurance. So you can see why the VA loan truly can be the best loan for a veteran. Now, the, the rates are usually always in a better position too than when we're looking at conventional uh, as well. So that's another item. But you know, if, if you're a veteran and you're not sure if you're eligible, you can always talk to a lender and they can pull your certificate of eligibility. There's different criteria for service requirements to get your certificate of eligibility, it depends on that. There's so many criteria. It depends on if you're, uh, if you were in active duty, if you're in the national guard, what, what, uh, uh, what, what places you actually served. So uh, you can actually go through the VA portal and find some of that information, but you can always talk to one of us too, if you're not sure if you qualify or if you have a client that comes to you and they're not sure that they qualify, we can always pull their certificate of eligibility and find out for them. The other cool thing about the uh, VA loan is that condos are okay. We actually uh, just got approved for a condo down in the Bozeman area. And, you know, we just had to provide certain information, articles of incorporation, different condo documents to then get it approved with the VA. And so a veteran can buy a condo on a VA loan, which is really nice, especially again, right now, when we're dealing with the price points that we're at, condos are often a little more affordable in certain areas. So it really does give some options for veterans when we can get the condo approved through the VA. And it's actually not super complicated. You just need to have an HOA willing to give you some documents. 
Uh, but again, zero down, no mortgage insurance, and a really good rate on a condo for a veteran is possible. Also, we talked about multi-unit with FHA. You can do multi-unit as well with VA. Zero down multi-unit, so no loan limit. You can literally buy a four unit, you know, at a million two. And if you, if you can afford it within your debt to income ratios, uh, but you can buy a multi-unit with the VA. The tricky part with the VA is that they really wanna make sure the veteran is set up for success. So when we're talking about multi-units, they wanna make sure that e the veteran either has experience renting these units or having rental experience in general, or if they don't have rental experience, they just wanna make sure they hire a management company. So that's something that we work with the veteran if they're looking at buying a multi-unit just to make sure that they're gonna uh, be able to handle the, the, the cost for the management company or if they've had history doing that. Uh, the other great thing when we talk about eligibility, I almost missed this, uh, VA actually allows really high debt to income. I literally have seen 75% on the debt to income. Now, it doesn't work if someone is high debt to income and then they don't have very much residuals. The VA looks at the residuals more than they look at the debt to income. Now, residuals are basically what you have left over. So even if your debt to income is 50% and you only have $500 left over for your the rest of your family's housing expenses, it, the VA is not going to allow that. So they really want to make sure that we're setting you up for success. Now, the higher debt to income ratio typically works with someone who has a little more income. So then their residuals are going to be several thousand dollars potentially. So it's just something that we look at as well. So, uh, and then with that, it also, we also have the ability with VA to do a lower credit score similar to FHA. So the VA is actually the most lenient on the credit profile. And because ultimately the, the VA wants the veterans to have a home. <laughs> so they really, uh, the guidelines are actually set up in a way that if it makes sense for the veteran to get a loan, they wanna help the veteran get a loan. Um, and then, yeah, with the high DTI, just making sure that residual uh, works in their favor and, and makes sense for the veteran as well. We talked a little bit in FHA with property standards. Again, VA is very similar, just health and safety are the biggest things with VA. And then you can get exceptions. So uh, the VA is, is really good about, again, making sure if this is the home for the veteran and there's an issue, then uh, depending on what's going on, you know, we can reach out to the VA and get an exception and the veteran is acknowledging the issue. And then we just provide that with our underwriting and then the VA will actually accept that. So it's a really good program. If people can fit into that VA loan, we really try to put them in that. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit about the USDA loan. So the USDA loan, if you can't qualify for a VA, the USDA loan is really the one that we try to fit people in the box. There's a few things about the USDA loan that make it difficult. And a lot of that is it does have debt to income restrictions. So with, we talked about FHA, the front end is 47, the back end I've seen as high as 56, but USDA is the front end typically needs to stay at 31% and the back end needs to stay at 41, 31, 41 general guideline. I have seen 34, 44. So we can push the limits depending on the credit profile. The problem with that is USDA also has income cap guidelines. So if you are a family of up to four, you can only make as a whole 110,650 if you're in the Flathead County. Each county again is different. So you have to look at the county specific income guidelines. Now, if you're five plus, your income can be as high as 146,000, 
and $50. So it really depends on family size. And honestly, if you have a high schooler that's doing a part-time job, they will include that income as well. So it's the income of the whole household that they look at. So that's, it, it's a narrow box that USDA can fit in, but the USDA has no down. The mortgage insurance premium is lower than FHA. So if you fit into it, your payment can be a lot lower. And again, the rates are in a really good position as well. But we really do look at if you fit within that USDA box, we show you what that loan looks like. And I mentioned at the beginning of the class, you know, we like to put things side by side because people need to see, our clients need to see that, you know, let's say they qualify for conventional USDA or FHA, showing them the three options and giving them an idea of like what their loan amounts are at three and a half percent, three percent and zero down. Those are important for a client to understand. And then just educating them about the fact that the mortgage insurance on USDA, if we're talking about that one, it actually stays on for the life of the loan. When you compare conventional, conventional does drop off when you hit that equity and having 20% equity. So again, just looking at the big picture with our clients and making sure that they have a full understanding of what they can qualify for within each of the loan programs is important. Now getting back to USDA, I digressed a little bit, but uh, USDA, you know, if we can get you into that loan program, you fit within the income limits, the property eligibility. So property eligibility is, it needs to be rural. Luckily, we live in Montana and most of Montana is rural. However, when you go to Missoula and Bozeman area in Billings, there are pockets within those areas that the rural development loan, you don't qualify. So uh, currently Flathead County is one that uh, we qualify for, but I'm, I'm thinking it's gonna change soon. It, they just have to do the population count. But right now, everything in Flathead County works for USDA. So if you fit within that box, then uh, we also have to look at a few other things with USDA. So. When you're, look, when you're looking at all these loan programs, USDA actually has some really good options for gaps in employment. We actually just, we closed a loan uh, in December that uh, the, the gal actually had a really large employment gap. She doesn't qualify for FHA. She didn't qualify for a conventional. The only program that worked for them was USDA due to the fact her employment gap was so large, it was almost a year long. So, and I mentioned with FHA, if it's a six month gap, uh, we, there's some things that we can do, but this was longer than six months. So she couldn't, she would have had to work at her new job for six months in order for her to be able to qualify for FHA loan. So she, they literally fit perfectly in this USDA box and we were able to get it closed and uh, she, she just needed a 30-day pay stub. So we were able to avoid a 66-month uh, employment history when I just needed that 30-day pay stub. So when you kind of look at the big picture, like each of these loan programs have their own sets of guidelines and just working with someone who's educated and has done hundreds of these loans because there's so many little intricacies to each of these loan programs in each of our borrowers that we really need to make sure that, you know, we're not just putting them in FHA because honestly, FHA is a great program that fits a lot of people, <laughs> but what if they qualify for USDA? We've got to look at that as well. So working with someone who's educated to be able to give you the full picture and, uh, and, and just make sure that you uh, know what you qualify for in all these different avenues. Okay, so that was a lot of information. I left a few minutes for questions. Does anybody have questions? Government loans, yes, from the audience. Does each of these three loans have at least one annoying piece of paper that you have to sign? To oh, to yeah, so a, a great question was asked. So these are government loans. And so the question was, do each of these loan programs have 
pieces of paper that are annoying that need to be signed? The answer is yes. <laughs> so uh, all these programs, you know, they at least have five, maybe more that are that program specific document that has to be signed. And oftentimes it has to be signed by the seller or if it's new construction by the builder, also the borrower and the seller, all that stuff. So it gets annoying, but yes, um, we, we do it because it's a government loan and, and that's great. Oh, and the other thing, you know, just to talk, to kind of wrap this up a little bit, if there's more questions, great. Uh, the VA loan and FHA loan are assumable. So that is kind of a, it becomes a hot topic. The, the weird thing about assumable loans is that, you know, we don't do a lot of them just because they're not that simple. So when you think about an assumable loan, basically it means that another buyer can come and basically take over that loan. So what the rate was, the terms, everything basically pick it up. If you're five years in, they can pick it up at your, for the 25 year term remaining. However, oftentimes sellers don't want to just sell their property for just that amount that's owed on that note. So that's where it gets tricky. So if you start seeing uh, even sellers advertising like, Hey, you can assume my, assume my loan, just know that that borrower is going to have to make up the difference. So yeah, if they qualify for VA or FHA and they want to assume that loan, but then the seller also wants to sell it for a hundred thousand more, that borrower is going to have to come up with that hundred thousand to make up the difference. I've seen it work a little better with family situations. So uh, if they're just acquiring the property and the family member is going to just take over, that sometimes works a little better, but uh, that's what the assumable loan is. And FHA and VA are assumable loans. Anymore, I don't know why that came up, but your question sparked that. So any other questions? All right, I am officially government loaned out. <laughs> but um, again, like I said at the beginning of the class, there's a lot to these government loans and I literally just scratched the surface on each one of them. When a client comes in, we really try to educate them so they know, you know what they can qualify for and maybe they only qualify for one and that's okay. We give them the information and uh, then, you know, maybe six months down the road, they can qualify for another one because the situation changed a little bit, but really just educating our borrowers is the key that we like to do. And uh, yeah, we do it every day and, you know, we want to talk to you about it. If any agents out there have questions, uh, let us know. We, uh, our loan hotline is always available, uh, which is 406-862-4999. And you can call or text anytime. Hope you guys have a great day. And that is it for FHA, VA, and USDA loans. Thanks.